Hi, my name is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to share easy to understand evidence-based holistic insights to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, I'd like to talk about six really important considerations that you must consider when contemplating upgrading your home. You know, where you live from a location perspective and the type of property and the accommodation size and finish that you live in, obviously it can have a really large impact on your standard of living. That is, if you live in a really nice home that really suits your requirements in an area that you really enjoy living in, it can make a massive impact to your standard of living, something that sometimes we underestimate. But also, if you make some really smart moves with respect to how and when you buy your home and when you upgrade, it can also have a dramatic impact on on your financial position as well. And that's why it made me think that this subject would be such a valuable sort of insight to talk about some of the things that we discuss with our clients to consider when upgrading their home. My first tip is to approach the decision with an investment lens. Now, typically when we go and buy a home, we don't necessarily have a financial motive in doing so. In fact, quite often we just really think about the lifestyle considerations. You know, we want a home that's close to work, school, family, friends, and other interests, you know, close by leisure activities, you know, a nice shopping strip down the road with good restaurants, etc. And these tend to be the main consideration. However, if you buy well, it can be one of the best investments, particularly from an after-tax perspective that you'll ever make. And there's a good reason for that. Firstly, that we tend to be quite aspirational when we first purchase a home and we try to push our financial budget to get into a desired area, whether that's the right school zone or close to the city and other amenities and so forth, but we tend to buy, you know, high quality assets. And then secondly, we tend to hold our homes for a long period of time, I should say, sometimes many decades. And as a result, we get to enjoy the compounding capital growth. And we also, you know, keep our home in good repair. You know, we might make, in fact, make improvements to it, extensions and so forth, which ultimately goes towards improving its value as well. And all that capital growth is, tax-free and there's not too many things in life that are tax-free and that's why it can be one that sometimes may be the best investment we can make. So therefore, what I try to do is counsel clients to take an investment lens when choosing a home. So to put that differently, it's really go and buy yourself an investment grade property and then occupy it. Now, by definition, an investment grade property should have wide appeal, should be in a desirable location. The dwelling should be in livable condition with a workable floor plan and close to amenities and all those sorts of things. So it's quite often it's doable to be able to tick both those boxes, that is, by something that's otherwise a great investment and also something that meets our lifestyle considerations. There's going to be probably two occasions, two that I can think of, where that's going to be more difficult. Firstly, if your budget doesn't extend to allow you to buy in an area that is considered to be investment grade, then you might have to make some compromises compromises, but then it's about making as few compromises as possible. Or if you have some lifestyle desires that mean that it's not going to be an investment grade asset. So for example, if I want to live out in the middle of nowhere, hundreds of kilometers away from a capital city, of course, I'm not going to be able to apply an investment lens. But for most people that live in capital cities, you know, they want to live in a really attractive suburb. They might want to live in a particular school zone, for example. And quite often we can buy what is will make a great investment property and then occupy it. My second tip is to be realistic whilst also being aggressive, which I know sort of contradicts itself. So what I mean by that is that it's advisable to really stretch yourself as much as possible, push your comfort zone to borrow as much as you can afford to borrow, to try and buy a higher quality asset. Having said all that though, it's absolutely critical not to overextend yourself to the point where it will hinder your ability to invest in other assets down the track. So you want to get that balance right. Quite often people sort of adopt the mindset to 
think, well, we should try and limit our non-tax deductible borrowings, our home loan, as much as possible. And therefore, they might end up saying, well, we want to live in this area, but let's make some compromises to sort of fit it into a lower budget. And it ends up being sort of counterproductive because you end up making compromises on the asset quality and therefore, you know, you might end up with a lot lower capital growth. And so some good examples might be, you know, buying on a busy main road, for example, that property is going to be cheaper than if it was located in a nice quiet street. But the one in the nice quiet street is probably almost certainly going to have a higher capital growth. And also another example, buying a floor plan that just doesn't really work and a regular block shape that's not really economical. You know, these sorts of compromises just aren't worth making and you're actually better off to kind of stretch your budget a little bit to try and get yourself into a much better quality property. And in doing so, you're most likely then to maximize your future capital growth rate. So sometimes limiting your budget or trying to minimize as much as possible is a false economy. Now, having said all that, you don't want to borrow too much. You know, you don't want to borrow to the extent where the home loan's going to suck out all your surplus cash flow, or in fact, that you won't ever get to a point where you're going to be able to repay that loan uh, without downsizing down the track. And I'm not talking about of downsizing as a strategy. It could be a strategy, but there's risks associated with that strategy. Sometimes I've come across people that I feel like they've borrowed way too much non-tax deductible debt, and it actually paints them into a corner where it's a case of really, we've got to put all our cash flow towards debt reduction. You know, we limit our opportunity costs associated with, you know, making extra super contributions, investing in shares, doing those sorts of things. And whilst we might end up with unencumbered home by the time we get to retirement, we actually don't have any other retirement assets to fund retirement. So it's not very productive. So therefore, with respect to this, I would say, look, push your comfort zone, push as much as possible, but not too far to the extent where it just becomes a big burden, the debt burden associated with the home loans just too much. I've had, uh, you know, in the past, and I've shared some case study episodes about this as well, uh, clients where I've sort of pushed them a little bit to say, hey, can we spend a little bit extra on this home to get a better quality property? And notwithstanding the financial impact, you know, just the lifestyle impact for them has been tremendous. And they often reflect back and say, look, Stuart, I'm so glad we did it. You know, five years ago, it seemed like a lot of money and it was a lot of money, but the impact on our family and our standard living has been so significant. So it's really important to get that budget right. Okay, the third tip is really to consider whether you should retain your existing home and convert it into an investment property that is rented out. You know, typically people have an emotional attachment to property, particularly properties of which they've occupied, and especially properties if they're their first asset that they've purchased. So it's really important that you get some good quality advice here and don't get too clouded by your emotion. There's not a one size fits all but with respect to thinking about should you retain your existing home. It's not just as simple as saying, will it make a good investment? Yes or no. You have to think about things like borrowing capacity, you know, how much you're borrowing on the other side to do the upgrade, loan to value ratios, cash flow, even gearing can be a a significant consideration. For example, if you have repaid all the debt against your existing home and then you have to go and borrow to do the upgrade, you're going to end up with investment that's ungeared and that's tax deductible and a home that's not tax deductible, the debt it isn't tax deductible and you end up with a lot of debt in there. So sometimes you're just better off divesting, selling that asset, pulling out the equity, borrowing less on the other side, and then replacing it with a pure investment property. I think my best advice is go and get some independent advice. You need to think about, you know, what are the tax consequences associated with converting into an investment? What are the borrowing considerations? So is it doable? And that would be the first point of call to speak to your mortgage broker to say, hey, can I hang on to both these assets? And then speak to a buyer's agent to get an independent opinion as to do we think this is a good investment property? You know, if we didn't already own it, would we go and buy it as an investment in the first place? That's a really good question to ask yourself. But it isn't just a natural, yes, try and hang on to it. If you can, there's a bit more to it. Okay, so the next consideration I want to talk about is should you buy before you sell? So obviously selling your current home before you buy a replacement home can pose some challenges. You know, without purchasing a new home before the other one settles, you risk being homeless. And of course, then if you think, well, like I'll go on rent, um, the problem is you don't necessarily want to commit to a 12-month rental lease. If you think, well, you know, you could find a property to buy in a month's time, it'll settle in two months' time, and all of a sudden you've got this remaining lease that has nine months left on it, and it just doesn't make a lot of sense. 
So it can be a little bit more difficult and it's far more convenient to really buy first and then sell later. The other benefit of that is you get to move out of your existing asset and stage it and move a lot of the clutter out, um, declutter it. And also you don't have to then end up doing all these cleans for two or three open houses every week. It can be quite disruptive and stressful, particularly if you've got a young family and pets and those sorts of things can kind of get in the way with open for inspections. Now, when considering whether you're able to buy before you sell, there's really two main factors. Firstly, it's really crucial to have a realistic expectation on your the sale price that you will receive from selling your existing home. You want to be quite conservative in your calculations and you don't want to sort of overestimate. You also then have to ascertain, you know, how marketable your asset is, you know, how quickly can you sell it? Or if it's a very unique asset, you know, might be just too risky to buy before you sell. The second consideration is you've got to assess whether you can come up with the money. You know, how are you going to fund buying before you sell and be able to pay for that property before you sell your existing property and receive the proceeds from that? And there's really three options that potentially are available to people. The first one is if you have enough income and equity, you might have sufficient borrowing capacity in and of itself to go and buy that home without any pressure to sell, you know, that upgraded home without any pressure to sell your existing property. And if that's the case, that's the best outcome because then that way you don't have any compulsion to be able to sell within a certain period of time. If you can't afford to borrow the full monies to be able to purchase first, then the second option is bridging finance, which essentially enables you to pay for your asset first. So even though you're borrowing more than what you can really afford longer term, as long as you give the bank typically a commitment to sell within 12 months time. Now, it's important to note that bridging finance is more expensive, so don't offer discounts off the standard variable interest rate. You pay the standard variable interest rate, and so that could be somewhere between 2 or 3% higher than, than what you're currently paying, so it is quite expensive. But of course, you can use bridging finance as a fallback plan. So your strategy might be to say, okay, for example, we'll go and buy something. When we find something that we like and we've bought it, we'll put our home straight on the market. And the aim will be to try and sell it quickly and match the settlement dates. But you realize that if everything goes wrong, at least you can fall back onto bridging finance. And even if you've got to pay for bridging finance for 30 days or something like that, well, it's just the cost of doing business. It's part of the transaction. So you don't necessarily have to sign up for it. You can try and minimize Minimize the time naturally that you're going to use bridging finance. And lastly, you might be able to rely on family and friends, or probably really family, to either lend you money or allow you to use their equity in their home. So through a family guarantee, sometimes family can help out in these circumstances. But the best outcome here is organize yourself so that you're able to buy before you sell, go and purchase with as long a settlement as possible. And that way it gives you plenty of time to get your home on the market. It, and then hopefully you can line up the settlement dates or at least if there's not much difference, it's not going to cost you too much money. Okay, my fifth tip is really to assemble a really good team around you. And I know I've got a vested interest in saying this, but it is really an important decision that is multifaceted, that has so many angles to it. It really is important that you get some really good quality advice and that you're structured correctly. So of course, the mortgage broker is critical in this element. They're going to be able to help you with setting you know, your borrowing capacity, which is going to set what your budget is for the upgraded home. And then most importantly, how you're going to hopefully position yourself so that you're able to buy before you sell. Financial advisor can assist you in establishing a suitable budget so that it aligns with a long-term plan so that you can work out, okay, if we get ourselves into X amount of debt, how are we going to get ourselves out of debt as well as still make sure that we're going to have a comfortable retirement. Your accountant or tax agent can give you insights into the implications of converting your existing home into an investment property while still maximizing any negative gearing benefits. But I think probably the most critical assistance could come from a buyer's agent because they're going to offer you some invaluable advice throughout the transaction and throughout what can be a very stressful transaction, particularly because it's our home, we've got an emotional attachment, we need to have somewhere to live. You want to make sure that someone's helping you through that situation 
situation. And we've had some great buyers agents help a lot of our clients. They will firstly give the client a really good indication of what their existing home is worth and how long it's going to take to sell that and who is the best agent to use and the method of sale. Then with a good brief, they'll go away and then help them find a good quality upgraded home to go and buy. And as soon as that is done, they can hit go on the sale transaction and help them through that. And by getting that advice, you're going to put yourself in a position where you're going to maximize your sale proceeds while still making a really good quality decision with respect to the upgraded home. So I think probably the buyer's agent arguably plays the most important role in that transaction. My next tip, tip number six, is to try and remain as unemotional as possible. And that sort of interlinks with the last tip in terms of making sure you've got a good team around you. You know, it's really difficult to be unemotional about financial decisions as it is. And sometimes our emotion is unconscious. It unconsciously affects our decision making. But when we're making decisions about things that are going to impact our lifestyle as well, at the same time as finances, it's even more difficult. And so that's why I think the buyer's agent occupies the most important role in this transaction is because they can take time to understand what's really important to you and make sure you stay true to that brief while still making sure that the property has the investment fundamentals and the lifestyle elements that are going to actually align with your goals. You know, make sure you don't get distracted by shiny objects. After many months of looking, you might feel a bit fatigued and then willing to compromise. You know, they can provide that voice of reason that ensures that your budget is spent wisely. And remember, you're going to have to live in this home for for many years or maybe even decades. So it's a really important decision to get right. And then when it comes to selling your existing home, they're going to give you really good quality, unbiased advice, hopefully on, you know, things like how to present the property, whether to make any cosmetic improvements, the timing, the right agent, those sorts of things. You know, when selling a property, if you sell in a great market and you've got a great property, it's really just about getting out of the way and letting the buyers do all the hard work. And it doesn't take a lot of skill and experience in order to do that. Of course, you've got to market it properly, but it's when you hit some problems. So if there is not enough demand or there's some pushback on certain things, that's really when you need the skill and expertise of not only the selling agent, but then the buyer's agents to help you navigate around some of those those issues. And then if the market changes during the campaign, that can be really stressful too, because you're thinking, you know, what is the agent doing? Are they conditioning us to accept a lower price? Or is it really that the market has changed? It's a stressful time. And to have someone in your corner to sort of navigate through this is really useful. Again, I'm speaking from experience. I've helped lots of clients through these transactions, upgrading transactions. And the ones that have been successful are the ones that have seeked out that professional advice and guidance. And it's still been a stressful process, of course, but it's really reduced the stress. And most importantly, they've made a really good quality decision. And last but not least, the seventh tip is really don't try and time the market. You know, we like to think, well, let's buy low, sell high. You know, so if you get a good deal on the upgraded home, you might think, well, let's hang on to the existing home and try and sell in a more buoyant market. That can be challenging. What you really want to try and do is do the changeover in the same sort of market conditions. So if you're in a hot market, okay, you might have to overpay for the upgraded property, but it probably means you get more for the one that you're selling. You know, if you're in a cooler market, you might get a good deal on your upgraded property, but then you might have to take a little bit of a haircut on your existing one. It's too difficult to try and time markets and property markets can move very quickly. So literally from one weekend to the next, they can move and we might think it's an aberration. We might think, oh, that's just, you know, a strange sale. But until we start seeing a few sales at that price point, then it's only then we've realized that the market has changed. So forget about timing. Just try and execute in the same market as you possibly can and realize that because you're buying and selling, it doesn't really matter. It'll net each other out. And in fact, if anything, it's probably easy to do that in a cooler market, but assuming that when you're doing the upgrade, you're spending more. So the price that you pay for the upgraded asset starts to become more important than the price that you sell your existing asset as. So there you go. Lots of considerations. It's a really important decision. I keep saying it can be one of the best decisions you ever make, not only from a financial standpoint, but also from a lifestyle consideration. There's some of the common considerations that we take clients through. There might be additional considerations given your circumstances, but hopefully that's a really good start to help you make better quality decisions. So as always, thanks for listening. Just a reminder, if you can leave a rating where you listen to this podcast, certainly help me sort of spread the word a little bit. And until next week, bye for now.